you got a dumb bigot. Vel Phillips, in her I own words, the next on Black Nouveau. Hello and welcome to Black Nouveau. I'm Milton Dockery. And I'm Faith Collis. We're glad you could join us. We'll have more on Val Phillips in just a moment. And we'll explore the colorful art of Sanji Hunt. We'll discuss the importance of the census and hear from the first African American to play at the National Basketball Association. But first, Val Phillips. She's been the first woman and the first African American to do so many things of importance for Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and the nation. Our Liddy Collins has a first of a two-part interview with the legendary pioneer. This uh, place will be named uh, forever after her as the Juvenile Justice Center. The intelligence of this black woman made her a woman of first, attorney, alderman, judge, and secretary of state for Wisconsin. Belle Phillips, a Milwaukee native, graduated from North Division High School. At a time that there were very few blacks in the school, maybe six in the whole school. She went on to graduate from Howard University, a historically black university, where she said her future was shaped. It was my first um, experience in a whole black thing. And um, I was so taken with some of the people who were there, like Howard Thurman, who was very well known in the religious world. And, E. Franklin Frazier and Alain Locke and wonderful black leaders, you know, intellectuals. And I was, it, it's my first experience of really knowing who I was and our history. After Howard University, Val Phillips came home to the University of Wisconsin-Madison to attend law school. Her collection of firsts began here. What was it like going from Howard University and then going to UW-Madison? Oh, it was so different. Uh, the, the law school was difficult, of course. And um, I laugh when, when people say, of course, I was the first African-American woman to graduate from the law school. But that was it. And people make such a big thing of that. But it really, there were only about 15 women in the whole school. So it was very... It was very easy to be the first black African American woman, so it wasn't a big deal. 1956, Phillips added to her first and became the first woman and first African American member of the Common Council in Milwaukee. One reason, reapportionment of districts. We created a ward that had nothing, had no, I could have run for uh, the county board, I could have run for uh, state representative because it were all these are open seats because there was nothing. It was just like a new ward and we happened to be smack in the middle of it, you know. How long were you on the Common Council? Almost 16 years. 16? 16. Wow. Mm -hmm. Just a little short of 16 years. These cats are just too dumb, <coughs> just too dumb to know when they have something going for them. You know, things are, are, are it's, it's bad enough to have to deal with, with, with a bigot. But when you got a dumb bigot. And then I left from the council to, um, to be on the bench. And then uh, because <coughs> I was not reelected, I, I was appointed, so I was really not elected ever mm -hmm. because it was, there had never been a woman. Uh, uh, judge in, in Milwaukee County and there was only one in the state way up north and she won an election about two weeks before I was appointed. You were attorney, was being a judge one of your goals? Uh, not really, no. Pat Lucy appointed me because he um, he, he's the one that said, well, I want, uh, my first appointment is going to be you on the bench. I said, well, you got to win first, boy, you know. And so he said, oh, I'm going to win, and he did. And he did appoint me immediately, as soon as, he could, as, soon as there was a vacancy. And um, George Bowman was on the bench at the time, and I was at Children's Court. That's why they renamed the Children's Court after me. 
But George Bowman, I'll never forget, he said, you know, Val, if you're really sort of uh, hard and want to, you know, send everybody to jail, you'll soften. And if you come on, if, you, if you're soft and sympathetic and kind of a tearjerker, you'll harden as you go along. And he was quite right, you know. I guess I was um, be a little, I, I wouldn't say I ever got to be hard. And that was hard. How did you come to run for Secretary of State? Well, because um, the, uh, when there was reapportionment, there was no reapportionment for 30 years. And this uh, Secretary of State Zimmerman said that he was not going to okay any election unless they had reapportionment. And at the time, I was not, I had run for nothing, you know. But I thought that was so brave. And I just sort of thought that I kept in, kind of in touch with, with, the, with the Secretary of State. And of course, the Secretary of State on a national level is very important. So I had no idea. I just thought that would be kind of fun. And it was a statewide election and a new challenge. So I decided to do it. And you won on a statewide election? A statewide, um, as we speak to this day, there's no other black in the state of Wisconsin who has won a statewide election, except me. The 2010 census is underway. It's the nation's method of figuring out who we are, where we are, and most importantly, how much our local governments get from the federal budget. Joining us are Sharon Robinson, Administration Director for the City of Milwaukee, and Teresa Thomas Boyd from Leadership Conference for Civil Rights. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Sharon, the census form will be arriving shortly. How long do citizens have to fill them out? The form, you're right, it, it'll hit the mailboxes next week, like starting next week around mid-March or the 15th, and the census form is really short. It's the shortest in history and only takes 10 minutes to complete. Give me an example of a question that citizens might find on that form. Okay, and basically there's only 10 simple questions, and the, uh, the questions basically relate to the age, date of birth, gender, race, and ethnicity of every person in the household. So it, again, it's very simple, that's it. Okay. Now Sharon, why is it so important that citizens fill these forms out? It's so important because the census is much more than just a simple count of the population. Every year the federal government doles out 400 billion annually to state and local governments. So that's like money for education, health care, transportation, job training, and more. And basically if we undercount this population, for every resident that goes uncounted, we lose $12,000 over a decade. Let's stress that again now. For everyone that's not counting, how much do we lose over a decade? We lose $12,000 over a decade, which equates to millions and millions wow. of dollars lost, even wow. if there's an undercount of 1,000 residents. Now, Teresa, what makes this of interest to groups you represent? Well, it is very important because we are working with churches, nonprofit organizations, service organizations. Um, basically, we're looking at who the messenger is okay. that can talk to people that they can trust, that they can feel comfortable with asking questions, and then to make sure that they understand every person, as Sharon was saying, whether they're one day old to a hundred years old, okay. must be counted in order for our communities to get the monies that we deserve. The key term I heard, uh, you mentioned is trust. Yes. Uh, oftentimes in minority communities, they're very much untrustful of people outside of the community, more trustful of people in the community. Correct. Will those people talking to those in those urban areas or minority communities be from those areas? Yes, they will. We have been very fortunate in Milwaukee that along with the city that there's Wisconsin Voices and organizations that have partnered together to make sure that we even have monies going out to small organizations and to churches to say, get the word out. Not only from posters, but this is forms that are being held. Um, they're inviting people to just have sessions from young to old to know what's going on and why they should fill them out. And the messenger then helps to bring um, 
not just a familiar face, mm -hmm. but people are more relaxed to ask questions. So for example, I went to a church that takes a care of about 150 um, people that want a hot meal. Mm -hmm. And I spoke to them and out of 150 people, not only did they ask questions, but they asked me to come back the next okay. week and to show them a form so that they would be familiar with it. Uh, not only that though, Teresa, there are a lot of myths in the minority communities in relationship to the census. Yes. What are some of those myths that you need to dispel? One is, who's gonna get this information? We wanna make sure that people know that there is a confidentiality must by the law that this information is not shared. And um, Sharon has shared with us, I think on a number of occasions, it's 72 years that they hold this information. So no one sees it, no one else gets it. It's by law, it is written in the US Constitution and they can be confident with that. People will serve time, you are penalized. People are sworn in to be confidential. So it is probably one of the most safest things that we're doing in our country ever in terms of getting information regarding people and then the information is not even shared in, um, about names or anything. It's basically given numbers of a population that is within a community. Thank you so much for sharing that confidentiality aspect because I'm quite sure that'll put a lot of people at ease. Yes. Now Sharon, are there still jobs available? Yes, the census is actually still recruiting for jobs and um, there's actually a wide range of jobs, not just the enumerator jobs where people knock door to door. And um, basically I touched base with the census about a week ago and it's my understanding that they're gonna keep the recruitment effort open through the end of this month at least because basically the jobs, um, many of them don't even start into early May. Briefly Sharon, what are some of the requirements to get some of these jobs? Uh, basically, there is a test that you have to take, and you can actually visit the census website, www.census.gov, to look at a sample of what that test looks like. So there's a minimum requirement, like where they're testing to see if you're good at sorting or if you're organized, but it's not like a real complicated test where they're testing for math, like high aptitudes of math. So okay. it's basically just making sure you're organized. Okay. Now, ladies, if people want more information, how can they go about getting it? Well, you can get information from the city's census website, which is www.milwaukee.gov slash 2010 census. And at that site, you can get sample forms and find out the answers to the most frequently asked questions. And there's also uh, contact information there. So you could access the Milwaukee local office phone number, which is 414-203-3840. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Sanji Hunt is an artist and native Milwaukeean who specializes in creating art on fabric. Liddy Collins has more on the colorful works of Sanji Hunt. This is the medallion collection that mixed media artist Sanji Hunt is currently working on. I love creating my own images. Um, I don't necessarily like the world as I see it. Uh, so I like to mix it up and chop it up and make it into something a little less identifiable, a little less something that anyone could stereotype when they look at it. Sanji Hunt was one of the showcase artists whose work was displayed at the Hidden River Arts Festival held recently on the grounds of the Sharon Lynn Wilson Center for the Arts, which featured only Wisconsin artists. Sanji Hunt's work was displayed along with a variety of different art styles. Some of my work is about emotions, a lot of it is about particular situations. No one would know that. I want it all to be very um, happy. I want people to be feel good when they look at it, but I also want them to get a visceral reaction from it. I like them to be elements of transformation for people too, or they're just pretty when you look at them, you know, if you're not that deep. Sanji started out as an oil painter and ended up being an art quilter. I, I love to paint and I've never let go of that. And um, I decided to use a lot of what I had. And I had a lot of fabric, a lot of canvas, and a lot of muslin. And so I started painting on that, which was weird for me because I didn't prime it. And we're taught to stretch our material in a particular way and prime it with gesso or rabbit's glue, whatever you're using. And 
I was like, well, I don't have to do that because it's not oil paint. It's, it, you know, it's not going to have this particular kind of reaction. And I remember just being like, oh, I shouldn't do it. Oh, yeah, I'm doing it. Oh, I love this. This is great. And then so then I wasn't rigid anymore. And I just did these yards of fabric. And, and I sew. And I started just sewing the stuff together. And I wanted to make it hard, like canvas would be, or paper. And, and uh, just started experimenting with a lot of stuff from the store. And then somebody said, hey, those are art quilts. And I went, oh, really? And it's a very relatable quilting, art quilting, anything to do with fabric sewing. People are drawn into it more. It's not so standoffish. There's no glass in between it. Um, people know how to do it and feel very comfortable with it and talking with me about it with other people at the at the openings we've had. A lot of people have um, more literal quilts and literal imagery but it just all blends together and it's a wonderful energy and a lot of it is if it were drawings I don't think that people would feel that same way you know. I saw I remember my grandmother drawing. No I haven't heard that but I remember my grandmother quilting and I remember my grandfather showing me how to sew this, you know, and they'll just make that kind of tactile uh, relationship to it and I think that's wonderful. Has it been hard making a living doing art in the Milwaukee area? Yes, it's hard to make a living as an artist in, the, in Milwaukee, I think especially as an African American artist. There's not a collector's market that is uh, African American based or even abstract image base. There's, it's, it's not anything that's cultivated, and um, I, I'm known outside of this area. Um, I've shown this year in Oregon, and Washington, uh, in Mississippi. I taught in Mississippi. Um, in, I'm going to be in the Reginald Lewis Museum in Baltimore with a traveling exhibit uh, called. Uh, textural Rhythms, uh, curated by Carolyn Maslumi, and she curates specifically for African American art quilters. And it's a three-year tour that's going to museums all across the country. Um, but I would say probably hardly anybody knows who I am here. Sanji writes a blog where she advocates for art, trying to break the myth that only a certain class of people collect original art. There's a whole uh, couple generations of of people that really have no idea why art is important. It's been taken out of the schools. It's um, it's not something that's really talked about. People stop collecting. You think of it as, as something that's in museums or really wealthy people have it. But other people buy posters. They go to Pier 1 and buy posters. They go whatever, anywhere, and buy a poster and frame it and put it up there and end up spending a couple hundred dollars. You could also buy a piece of artwork that's something really meaningful to you that you could collect and hand down. Sanji Hunt wants her work to communicate beauty. I am trying to communicate joy of life, um, even though the world, you read the newspaper, so depressing. Go out on your way to work, depressing. And I just want it to be beautiful and not have any particular point of why it's beautiful. It just is, and it's joyful, and it's bright, and, um, and the world can be that way. I want it to be something that brightens people's days. I don't want to make a social commentary. I love social commentary artwork. I'm just not the person to do it. I, I just want to bring that joy of living out and make it hopeful. Today, an overwhelming number of players in the National Basketball Association are African American, but 60 years ago, the NBA had no black players. That changed in 1950, when a number of players were drafted. Earl Lloyd was the first to actually play in an NBA game for the Washington Capitals. And then you realize, man, the common denominator is about to happen. And the great common denominator is, when you scrimmage and they throw the ball up, we all equal. Lloyd was born in Alexandria, Virginia in 1928. He played college ball at West Virginia State and was drafted in the ninth round by the Capitals. He played in over 650 games in nine seasons with the Capitals, Syracuse Nationals, and Detroit Pistons. Today, the 80-year-old Hall of Famer spends much of his time traveling and talking to young people about his experiences, 
On February 2nd, he spoke to a packed house at Marquette High School. First of all, I get asked, who influenced you the most in your whole lifetime? I had two coaches, my high school coach and my college coach. Big influence. But if you sit with me for 10 minutes and talk with me, you will know who influenced me the most. My mother, all five foot five of them. My father, nice man, hard working guy. And he kind of led by example, work ethic and all that. But my mother, whew, tough cookie. My first game as a Washington Capitol, now understand that this is 1950, and the N word was alive and very, very well. My first game, now you know how they introduce the visiting team first and the home team, and they introduced the starters last. So I happened to be in the last group. And as I ran on the floor, there were two white guys sitting right behind my mother and father. And one of them said to the other one, do you think this end can play in the ball? Now my mother, who's an expert in conflict resolution, She turned around and looked this dude dead in his eyes and said, trust me, the boy can play. At the end of the game, they, they, <laughs> they were bosom buddies. In my lifetime, at that particular time, the playing field was not level. But my first pro training camp was the first time in my life I experienced a level playing field. The first scrimmage, they threw the ball up. Because the ball don't know what kind of hands it's in. And I said to myself, now you've been told all your life and treated all your life inferiorly. If you have a statement to make, now's the time to make it. I made some statements. And I had to apologize to some of my teammates. And I explained to them, look, man, don't take this personal. I said, for all the trials and tribulations I experienced, somebody's got to pay. <laughs> and you are unfortunate, man, because you are convenient to me every day. He was asked about the toughest opponents he faced. Bill Russell was never a welcoming sight. We had a player watcher. We had a guy, when we went to Boston, we had one guy watching the Celtics run on the floor, hoping he was hurt. So I have to say Bill Russell. But the toughest guy that I had to guard one-on-one -on -one was Elgin Baylor. Although he had to overcome racial barriers, Lloyd says he doesn't consider himself a pioneer like Jackie Robinson. Jackie Robinson was an island, man. He's out there all by himself, man. His own teammates didn't want to play with him. In fact, if, if you can remember back, <clears throat> Dixie Walker was hitting 343 for the Dodgers, the leading hitter in the National League. He said, I'm not going to play with him. So Brent Ricker said, you're right, because you're going to Pittsburgh. But it's, you know, and fans vilified him, man, and it's, the opponents try to hurt him. And here's a guy that got, obviously has fire in his belly, but he's told he can't fight back. See, nobody told me, man. I mean, if, if some guy tried to hurt me, you know, if it's a choice of him, him hurting me or me hurting him, you know, he's got to go. But he was hey, one of my idols, man. He knows the game has changed and has mixed emotions about today's players. Most of the, uh, most of the guys who reach this level, they've probably been spoiled right from middle school. So... <laughs> But I tell you what, they got some real, real talented people, man. And I mean, they're big people, man, they're agile, and it's a pleasure to watch. I mean, some guys get a little uptight about their fundamentals and all that. I said, man, you can say what you want to say, man. You look at a kid like Tracy McGrady, who's six foot nine, And not just him, I mean, LeBron James, because LeBron is a phenom. 
But they got some people out there, man, can truly play. Kobe Bryant can play. And it's a bunch of them. Just Michael Red can play. So it's... All, only thing I ask guys, I say, man, look, you know, just every watch, when that group leaves, make sure you leave it a better place for the folks coming behind you, man. And that wraps up this edition of Black New Book. And as always, be safe. And remember in the coming week, do something to expand your world. Good night. Good night, and thanks for watching.